Hello and welcome to the session titled Risk Reset. My name is Lutfi Siddiqui. I'm a visiting professor at the London School of Economics, LSE Ideas, and an adjunct professor at the Risk Management Institute in Singapore. So Risk Reset, uh, let me try and win the award for the most understated statement of, uh, of the year. Let's just say that this year has taught us some important lessons in risk management and risk resilience. How do we frame risk versus uncertainty? How do we distinguish between risk that arrives as one impactful shock versus risk that builds up incrementally in a series of small disturbances, sometimes amplified by my actions and your reactions and the feedback loop between them? How about the, the psychology of risk or the politics of risk? Why is it that it seems to be the case that it's easier to raise money for, to put it cr crudely, it's easier to raise money for coffins than it is for medicine? Why is that the case? How do we justify allocating resources or spending money to protect ourselves, our companies, our communities against risks which may not materialize in the end? especially when the pressure is on all of us to be super efficient. How do we deal with black swans, the truly unknown unknowns versus the gray rhinos, the risks that are, that are visible, but not compelling enough for us to do anything until perhaps it's too late. How does this all look from the perspective of government or the perspective of a global technology services company, or a provider of insurance whose job it is to put a price on risk. So that's what we will be talking about. And before I go to our distinguished panel uh, to ask them for their perspectives, let's get warmed up a bit. Let's try and get you, the audience, involved uh, straight away with a, with a question that you can vote on. Um, could we have the question, please? Uh, this is on Slido. Um, you, if, you, if you haven't joined a session earlier today, uh, you have to go to slido.com. The hashtag is SDIS or the QR code. Please answer this question. So looking ahead into the future, what risk is the world most unprepared for, least prepared for? Climate risk, 53%. Still moving around, let's give it a few more seconds. And what we will do is at the end of uh, the session, we'll come back to the poll again and see if the needle has moved. So I see that climate is still leading, although rupture in social cohesion is creeping up now uh, to 28%. So it's really climate versus social cyber is creeping up, but it's gone back down again. Okay, let's, let's give it 10 seconds and we will call it, we will close the poll in 10 seconds from now. All right, uh, could we, could we close the poll now, please? Thank you very much. So it looks like climate is still the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And the second place was between social cohesion and cyber creeping in towards the end. So allow me to go to our first panelist, Her Excellency, Dr. Rania Al-Mashat, Minister for International uh, Cooperation in the government of Egypt. Uh, over to you, Dr. Rania. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Siddiqui. And uh, let me say that the introduction you provided really uh, uh, sets the tone uh, for what everybody's thinking about. I mean, um, what we have learned uh, from this crisis is that there's a next new normal. And what I mean here, and I'm very happy with the uh, poll that started at the beginning, 
Um, there is, we are all prone for another crisis. It may not be a pandemic. It might be um, a, a cyber attack. We were very lucky this time that we were able to function with our internets working and our technology uh, being a very key tool in, in getting through this. Environmental uh, or climate crisis is another one. And this again uh, puts uh, the onus on, on more than one player in any society. Uh, if I'm talking about uh, the governments, governments have for very long been uh, bearing the brunt of what is known as the protection gap. Uh, and that is uh, coming in to help mitigate the impact on vulnerable groups. That has happened through public finances and public finances uh, have in many instances uh, been affected negatively. And it takes so much time and reform to fill in the coffers again. We, we saw 2008 and, and how much uh, and now I'm talking as a monetary economist and, and, and an ex-central bank and IMF. And here uh, you see uh, the cost of fiscal spending and, and, and how much uh, it affects debts. And we see that the, the debt rates that, uh, you know, that are, that are uh, globally now on the, on the rise. Uh, the other very important uh, point is that uh, we have all been affected by disruptions in supply chains. And that means that corporates and businesses, the word resilience, is one that requires to always be within the DNA of a corporate and therefore asset managers uh, need to make sure that there is enough investment uh, in uh, what creates resilience for a corporate. This is not to be belittled uh, or overshadowed in any way. Something else, uh, when we talk about insurers and so forth, how do we make sure that we also have sustainable models for corporates, sustainable models uh, for uh, businesses and putting all of this together, stakeholder capitalism, meaning that the government, the private sector, really have to have one language, an identified language that takes risk into account. It's no longer a department within a corporate or a department within a government institution. It really uh, has to be within our psyche. And this is what has been labeled as societal risk compact. We need to have a new societal risk compact where companies, governments, regulators, uh, the risk advisors all come together to really define uh, what are the steps that need to be taken to make sure that we do have uh, resilience all the time because resilience is what will make us stay relevant. If we don't have that within uh, 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 you know, what we do as a government, what corporates do, we, we are going to be uh, prone to face, uh, to face more, uh, more issues uh, down the road. The other very important lesson uh, that we've learned is that, uh, and I'm here, I'm talking from a government perspective, reform is a continuous process. Uh, in our case, uh, as Egypt, uh, we were able to withstand uh, the socioeconomic implications uh, uh, from COVID because there were a lot of reforms that happened between 2016 and 2019. So there was enough uh, foreign exchange buffers uh, on the fiscal side. There was a primary surplus. So you were able to come in quickly and try and mitigate uh, some of the health requirements as well as uh, the cash transfers and the social safety nets. Uh, but uh, again, uh, you know, uh, if more uh, crises were to happen, which, uh, which are not country specific, but now more global and all of us uh, get affected, that requires, again, a, a very agile way of thinking. Let me conclude by saying, uh, uh, through the World Economic Forum, we have a regional action group for the Middle East. And in that uh, a regional action group, uh, a group of uh, 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 my colleagues from uh, policymaking institutions and governments in the region, as well as CEOs from the private sector, have put together a, a stakeholder capitalism agenda uh, where we look at uh, uh, one of them has to do with uh, risk governance, uh, uh, more inclusion uh, uh, within the society, making sure that there is that environmental stewardship uh, and also uh, a focus on uh, the use of technology uh, to mitigate risks uh, by uh, uh, depending on the goods of the fourth industrial revolution. Let me conclude there. Thank you very much, Dr. Rani. It can't be easy being a proponent of international cooperation at a time when the world seems to be pulling back into deglobalization, more nationalism, more protectionism, and so on. So truly applaud you for that. Uh, from stakeholder capitalism to um, a captain of capitalism, uh, let me invite Mr. Chandra Prakash, uh, CP Gurnani, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Tech Mahindra, uh, to give us your views, please. So, thank you, Minister, and thank you, Professor Siddiqui, 
uh, for a brilliant reset. And, uh, you know, I'm a little surprised that, uh, you know, as you call me the capitalist, I am a little concerned that none of us have taken an economic recession uh, as one of the big factors. We have all seen governments in debt. We have all seen how, uh, you know, trillions of dollars have been committed to revival of economy. We have taken into account that the social unrest is bound to increase because of the increase in unemployment. Uh, to some extent, the reality is during the pandemic, last six months, 50% uh, of new adopters have come in into the digital world. But at the same time, there are people who, are, who cannot adopt. Uh, at least bigger countries like Egypt or India, I mean, we do, know, we do know that we have the last mile problem. Whether the last mile problem is telecom reaching the last person or the last mile is because a smartphone which will make the connected world, connected education, connected health, or a connected citizen services or connected government happen, there is still a huge gap. Uh, but anyway, let's go through some of the responses that the corporate sector has in a way worked with World Economic Forum to respond to the challenges. Uh, climate change, we all discussed. Uh, companies like Tech Mahindra have committed that 50% of our energy consumption would be by renewable energy. We have agreed with our board that our, we will become carbon neutral by 2030. We have taken very aggressive science-based target. And why am I repeating this part is, uh, Professor Siddiqui, only to say that if corporates can lead by example, and if they are able to partner with the policymakers and the corporate, uh, then we have a right uh, to, you know, make that, uh, uh, you know, loud statement that we are equal partners in the progress of the community or the society or the country. Uh, clearly, uh, when you look at some of these uh, sustainability objectives, you need to take into account that there are disclosures. And if we can all agree to certain level of disclosures, uh, to me, whether it is a, a format or a framework designed by World Economic Forum, or today what we follow, a Dow Jones, a Dow Jones uh, Sustainability Index, or a carbon disclosure project, I think we need to have a common standard across the world. Secondly, I do still believe that science is a bigger equalizer. The social you know, gap or the digital divide, I think we need to take into account that the cost of providing technology has reduced dramatically. And I'm sure minister would agree as a policy maker is that if, if today we did not have and AI tools, we would not be in a race for vaccine. I mean, today, every country is claiming that they have their own solutions. Or at least the, some of the advanced countries like UK, US, or uh, you know Switzerland probably are in a better shape. But in less than a year for a pandemic, if we are going to get into the third phase or the fourth phase of trials, we just we have to recognize it is the technology which is the equalizer. And technology also creates its own issues. Like for example, the, the survey coming back and saying global cyber attack. The fact is, in my opinion, it is going to be the higher priority. 
because we are so technology dependent, we are so data dependent, the number of devices which are now uh, an access to the network, every bulb or every Fitbit or uh, whatever the device that we all wear, the so-called health monitoring device or a steps monitoring device is a gateway to a cyber attack. So I think uh, the reset also requires a resolutioning. And my again opinion is uh, that technology is the bridge between the policymaker, be between the citizen and between the corporates so that we can all agree to a common agenda, common minimum agenda, and how we can address some of the world challenges in my opinion, we are unprepared for. Whether it is the next pandemic or whether it is the next safety issue or it is the next security issue or the sustainability issues or the societal issues. Thank you very much. Um, we'll come to uh, a bit more detail on some of these issues that you've just uh, brought up, CP. So. Um, digital, both empowering and also perhaps a source of new risks. Let me turn to the Group Chief Risk Officer of Zurich Insurance, uh, Peter Giger. Peter, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not even sure I call COVID a grey era, you know, because all, all I hear is that those are really rare. Uh, and, and pandemic are something that is kind of notorious to humans. Uh, they have happened in the past and they will happen in, in the future again. What is amazing is that kind of humans were surprised by a risk that was waiting to materialize and the writing was all over the wall. I'd go one step further, I'd, I'd say we were actually probably less prepared in many instances than we would have been 10, 20 years ago because the optimization of production processes, the, the, the highly technical uh, short-term optimization has taken out redundancy and slack. And I'll take European hospitals. How can it happen that they don't have a stock of personal protection equipment and, and are surprised that their just-in-time supply chain actually breaks? And I think that's what, what we need to learn. We need to learn that uh, redundancy creates resilience and, and that the systems need to allow for the unexpected and the nature of the unexpected is that we don't know it. Now, I wouldn't put COVID into that again because that was actually very foreseeable and it's kind of frightening if something really unexpected happened. I think part of the issue is that, that humans have a very short-term memory. You know, we're, we're very good in forgetting the threats of the past. And I think we're conditioned like that because it's good for our mental well-being. If we were to worry constantly about all the things that can happen to the world and to us, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. And I'm talking as a risk manager. I think you need to be an optimist. And, and we're conditioned like that. The point is, when it comes to risk management, we have to get over that human conditioning. We have to learn to, to deal with rare uh, events. We have to learn with, with life-threatening events. Uh, and, and I think uh, if, if we take that away from the crisis, I think that, that's a positive. If we're not walking away uh, now talking only about COVID because the next threat is going to be completely different. So, so let's prepare for what we don't have on the agenda as, as, as uh, challenging as that sounds. And I mean, insurance, what, what role can insurance play? And, and we, we heard a lot about that. Uh, I mean, we, we praise ourselves as, as experts in risk management. Uh, and then at the same time, you heard all the stories that insurers couldn't pay for the pandemic. And, and let me illustrate that. I mean, there is a saying that insurance is the principle where the many pay for the few. Uh, the pandemic created a situation where the many needed to be paid. And, and obviously, the capacity of the insurance market is just not big enough. Switzerland alone created an economic loss the size of the global insurance market capacity. 
just to give you an example. So Switzerland could have been insured, but nobody else. Uh, that can't be the right answer. And again, as a risk manager, I would suggest that we need to invest more in mitigation. And it's like in flood resilience. It's much cheaper to build a dam than to, to clean up the flood damage, not only financially, but also from a human cost perspective. And I think for me, that's the big learning here. The cost is actually not bearable to society if we let the risks run and materialize. We have to invest in mitigation. Mitigation is so much cheaper from, from every angle. And how do we convince kind of society to make these investments when the house is not burning? Because once it's on fire, it's too late. Thank you, Peter. So quite a few issues. Maybe I'll, I'll start with you uh, in, in the follow-up round. We're also getting questions coming to us through Slido, which is then being put on WhatsApp and sent to me. So I apologize for looking rude and I'm looking into my phone. It's not Facebook, I can assure you. Um, so the, uh, the question I have for you is, uh, I agree that um, you need to invest in mitigation upfront. Uh, and I don't think anyone is going to argue with that. The political economy question is not so much what needs to be done. It is, what is it, why is it that what needs to be done does not get done? Presumably because leaving things redundant has a cost of carry attached to that. How do we square that circle? How do we make it economically viable? Look, economically viable, it's a matter of what, what the perspective you take. Uh, because if, you, if you're taking a steady state, stable environment assumption and ignore the risks, you come to different conclusions. And it's, it's at the core of the sustainability question. What is a sustainable system? What is a sustainable company? What is a sustainable country? Uh, is, it, is it sustainable if you look at it in a steady environment for the next 360 days, I, I, I'd challenge that. Sustainability to me means that, that you're able to cope with a changing environment, that you're able to cope with threats that your environment necessarily poses on you. And, and that sustainability is, is something that I think we have lost sight of. Uh, and, and, and I think we need to go back to it. And then the economically viable takes into account things that can happen and, and the, basically account, accounts for it. You can, you can monetize it. Yes, you can. Uh, but but I, I don't think everything is being expressed in money. When we talk about flood damage, the human tragedy, what's the value of that? Avoiding that is, is, is a value in itself. So it's not only about financials. But from a government, perspe government perspective, it's really kind of do you govern for the next election or for the next generation? And, and I think that's the challenge in front of us. And, and climate change is the classic example. You're not re-elected potentially for the right measures, but you may right. save the planet. Um, Minister Rania, if I may come to you, uh, all three of you have mentioned the need for greater cooperation, whether that's within the country across sectors, corporates, uh, private public partnership, or internationally between countries. And I'm thinking of, you mentioned the, the financial crisis. I'm thinking of the 2009 Gordon Brown G20 meeting, Jan 2009, uh, where they came together in London and we felt that that had a really stabilizing effect because it was a unified global response. It's hard to imagine something like that in the current geopolitical environment. How do we deal with that problem? I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, 2009 uh, and 2008 uh, were, were made easier by the... Sorry about that. Uh, they right. were made easier by that uh, multilateralism and, and, and fast global response. Uh, we're not seeing that as, as much as we did before. Uh, nonetheless, for all the reasons that were mentioned, uh, there is no escape from it. And uh, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, now there are new terms coming out, but they, I, they, they, they aim for the same thing. If we're talking about 
uh, uh, the Great Reset, if we're talking about stakeholder capitalism, it's just another way to say that there has to be a multilateral setting and uh, the actors within the multilateral setting go beyond governments. And uh, that, is, that is, I think, uh, the essence of what uh, this crisis has shown. And I do agree uh, with Peter that, uh, you know, humans are myopic, they forget, uh, but the implications from COVID are going to be lasting longer than any of us expect. Uh, and that is going to push uh, all of us to collaborate, whether we, we like it or not, because nobody has the silver lining themselves, sorry, the silver bullet themselves. Uh, it is really a coordinated effort that can provide uh, a meaningful uh, uh, outcome uh, for different uh, populations. For instance, uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Mr. Shander, when he mentioned uh, the importance of digitalization and, and how uh, the digital divide can actually lead to more societal uh, problems. And these societal problems in one country will also have implications on other countries. So there is that need to make sure uh, that uh, the objectives uh, are identified. And um, this whole concept of SDGs, and we're in the um, uh, in this forum uh, this week, the UN uh, uh, week, uh, the SDGs are the goals where, where countries have come in and said this is the common denominator uh, where uh, we need to work on uh, um, uh, objectives that affect humans and citizens, uh, whether it's health, whether it's gender, whether it's clean water. The 17 SDGs really uh, push towards, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a better life. And that requires the mitigation of risk that, uh, that, was, uh, that was mentioned. In our case, uh, and, I, I, and I call it, you know, as Minister of International Cooperation, uh, my role is to promote economic diplomacy. And economic diplomacy requires multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, when we uh, work with line ministries and development partners uh, to design uh, a, an ODA project or a development project, everybody needs to be around the table. The civil society is there, our development partner is there. It could be bilateral, it could be multilateral. Um, and really it is, it is, it is through that uh, uh, economic diplomacy that we're trying to push uh, more engagement. And let me just conclude by one thing. Because we tend to forget, and because we tend to forget crises, we also tend to forget successes. And what is very important is that when people work together and a good story comes out, we have to keep on pushing that good story so that it is, uh, you know, everyone wants to see success and be part of it. And that's why within the ministry, we, we started a, a, a global partnerships narrative where we collate the effort that we are doing with our development partners, whether multilateral or bilateral under one theme and concept that we're trying to push domestically and globally, and that is people and projects and purpose. So that's, uh, that's another way to push for um, a good story. That's a great idea to celebrate successes and, and advertise them so that we update our self-beliefs and, and what's possible and what's best practice. Um, CP, so if I could come to you now. Uh, stakeholder capitalism. I confess that as recently as January this year, when that was the theme of Davos, uh, there was some skepticism as to whether it's rhetoric, words only, or whether companies are sincere and serious about implementing stakeholder capitalism or not. Um, eight months on, it now looks like that for a variety of reasons, including for the enlightened self-interest, the commercial interest of companies, it is now something that has a lot of momentum going. But you also hear from companies that, look, we are in the middle of a crisis right now. We are on the cusp of a recession. The economic uh, strains on our financials, on our balance sheet is gonna be tremendous. Can we talk about all of these things next year? Let's deal with the immediate here and now. Um, ESG, sustainability, all of this is for another day. How do you respond to the pressure of, of that sort of a, a thought process? I think again, uh, Professor Siddiqui, you know, just to rephrase what the minister had to say, it is not about celebrating success, but it is about, I am rephrasing it as remaining positive and remaining purpose-driven. Because the fact is that there would be speed breakers, there would be reasons 
why there would be setbacks. Question is whether we want to talk about the comebacks instead of the setbacks. Now, to me, again, uh, you know, whether it is sustainability or whether it is any other initiative, ultimately, we have to put it in a weighing scale and say, is it corporate social responsibility or is it what is a necessity? The reality is that all those initiatives uh, have been rewarded by the stock exchange. If you are a more sustainable corporation, if you are a co company which uses green marshals, if you are a good citizen to the community, the market has always rewarded you. If you're seen as short term, I mean, the market has discounted you. Now, whether you call it as a P multiple or whether you call it a measurement of a market capitalization. Uh, similarly, I again want to reuse the same sentence that I used in the past, that if you look at all your response systems, the reality is, uh, you know, Peter is right, that when it comes to all of us know what the inevitable is, but we will postpone it to the last minute, right? I mean, human nature. But ultimately, if we all try and put all the pieces together, all the, the, the risk reset things that you discussed, uh, whether it was economic recession or whether it was the cybersecurity, and most of the guys voted for climate. Now, it just tells you that let us take some of these as given, and there will be stresses because the social unrest is going to come because of either healthcare, employment, or education, or uh, you know the way we need to address even the unforeseen issues. The if you go back and look at the way the last six seven months have passed. It is the technology which is enabled. Everything in the house has worked. That is why we don't have unrest on the roads, right? Everything in the house includes communication, media, entertainment, whether you call them Netflix or you call them whatever. Everything in the house has worked because somebody is delivering the stuff to you. And everything is in a way got actually accelerated during this period online shopping, robo deliveries, digital and contactless payments. In my industry, 125,000 employees for Tech Mahindra, 92% work from home. It couldn't have worked if I was not creating a cyber secure environment, if I couldn't do virtual meetings seamlessly. So I can again repeat is, it is not capitalism. It is, I think, becoming socially responsible and leveraging the tools that each one of us has more effectively uh, to solve some of the immediate issues. Great, thank you. Let me now turn to the questions that are coming from the audience. And I will throw in a couple of mine as well. I will read out a few questions and you can uh, raise your hands if there are some that you wish to uh, answer yourselves. One question is about the fiscal uh, load of the immediate relief that has been offered by various countries. The minister mentioned that a country like Egypt or Singapore uh, that have had buffers they were able to deploy. But at some point, the assistance provided has to hit some balance sheet somewhere. So how do you deal with the potential fiscal challenge that is waiting in the wings? There's a question uh, that, that asks, why is it still the case? Uh, why is it the case that if investing in time and resources in prevention and risk mitigation is indeed a positive return on investment, then why is it that uh, more business leaders and policy makers haven't done that so far? Um, there is, um, uh, it's up on the screen. Uh, there's a question on, we're trying to solve all problems with money. How do we deal with topics 
that cannot be turned back on, that go beyond the tipping point. I assume this is to do with the climate uh, issue. And uh, I won't read all of them up, uh, just one more uh, to do with methodology. So uh, perhaps for Peter, is there fundamentally a different framework, a modeling exercise that we will now undertake going forward and how risk is predicted and framed and priced to how it used to be done in the past? So that's the marketplace. Um, who would like to answer which one? Uh, let, let me start with the first one because it's 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 actually a, an easy one. Hu humans have a, a a huge sentiment to knowing the future, and in insurance and other industries, we invest tons of money in. Now we call them predictive models. We call them artificial intelligence. We call them all kinds of things to tell us the future. Uh, the trick is the future is unknown. And uh, you cannot know what is unknown. And uh, I'd, be, I'd be very satisfied if we just recognized known probabilities better. Uh, I, I don't think we'll ever know the future. Uh, what life would that be, by the way, if we all knew our destiny? Uh, but, but we can do a much better job in, in recognizing visible probabilities, i.e. a pandemic is a quite likely event. I mean, that's not a one in a hundred years. That's a much more likely event. Why, why does it come that we ignore something like that? So I don't think it's a modeling problem. It's a perception issue uh, beyond that. Uh, will insurance invest in, in better pricing? Absolutely. Will it, will it solve the insurability of pandemics? Not at all. So I, I don't think the answer is necessarily in better modeling. This is there is much more philosophy than algorithm in the problem. Okay. Maybe on, uh, on the fiscal question, uh, what I can say is, um, um, uh, you know, one of the outcomes of uh, this pandemic is that everybody is going to be in higher debt, whether that's the household, whether that's the private sector, whether that's a government. And there will be uh, a moment uh, where we will have to have a dividing line and see how can we uh, really assess that debt situation. Of course, there's a lot of uh, quantitative easing that is happening and, 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 you know, that will have its effects. And as uh, CP was mentioning, it, it makes itself on, on, uh, on Wall Street as well. But, but that, is a, that is a reality. Debt uh, restructuring will uh, come into play. There will be many companies that are going to work on debt restructuring for, for, for different uh, agents in, in, in an economy. Uh, so that is definitely uh, one of the fallouts uh, of uh, of this situation. I think I think the the important uh, issue is in reinvestment because there will be debt restructuring, but we want to invest in order to, uh, of course, we don't know the future, but as much as possible mitigate possible risks or do investments better in technology, better in AI, better to to give incentives for companies um, for the uh, ESG and and so forth. And there's this point about uh, profit and purpose. There is, there shouldn't be this trade-off, and I think that's uh, what was mentioned. That companies are able uh, to get uh, returns by uh, being responsible, and and citizens, uh, customers are really voting now uh, by their feet, uh, buying a product for a company that is responsible. And it's uh, and governments are going to have to face a situation where it's going to be a very competitive landscape, and unless you have a proper environmental uh, policy, unless you have uh, proper incentives for doing good, uh, you know, uh, companies might be hesitant. For the first time today, we see uh, stress tests for banks taking into account climate uh, and uh, investments by banks into uh, uh, a climately sound projects. So it's, I think, I think as as was mentioned, uh, models aside, there is a, a philosophy which is coming out. And you asked a very important question: Why do people uh, pay more for coffins uh, rather than uh, otherwise. And I think it's the point of sympathy and empathy. And as this crisis is creating more inequality, more divide, uh, the you know, people will want to and will call for bigger investments in things which uh, uh, help governments, corporates, and themselves avoid risks going forward. Thank you. 
So if Professor you would you like Sadiq, to take any questions? If I just would like to add just a few sentences. Uh, number one, you know, I, I belong to India and in a state called Rajasthan, which was a lot of small kingdoms. And even when they had an economic challenge because of the drought, because of the floods, the only way to actually come out of a crisis was spend your way through. Because otherwise the unemployment, otherwise. So if you look at the most beautiful palaces of Rajasthan, they've always been built during a crisis. Some of the road networks have been built during the crisis. So I think we need to spend our way. We need to take into account whatever balancing factors, uh, whether it is air pollution or whether it is cybersecurity, we need to balance all of that. But I don't think there is a, there is a way, any other way, but to spend your way through. Thank you. Uh, one more question here about the apparent conflict or the, or the opposing trends of increased digitalization on the one hand and also increased digital decoupling on the other side or the fragmentation potentially between a China sphere and the US sphere. I think it's a question for you, CP. How do you deal with this tension between the two? I mean, I do agree that uh, there is a digital fragmentation. I agree that while digital technology has brought a huge economic and societal benefits to much of the global population, but unequal excess, lack of global technology governance, a lack of what I would call the frameworks to be able to pay for the un people who do not have the same level of exposure. I mean, I thought the governments were very good at doing that job, that uh, uh, Peter can pay for the Paul. Somehow when it comes to the telecom or the digital fragmentation, we haven't done a great job. I think the new technologies that are now coming in, particularly the space technologies, because of the way they are structured, they're through the low orbits of satellites, I think this problem will be behind us by 2030. Uh, okay. Until then, I mean, we still have 10 years to go. I would urge the governments to work with the private sectors. And it is not that people have not tried different projects. Google tried this balloon project, Facebook tried this electric poles project, because they were all trying to get new consumers, but don't treat them badly right. because they're trying to get new consumers because they're helping the government objective also of like a river water needs to be made available to every citizen. I think the digital bridge needs to be made available to every citizen and we, we do have methods to do it. Right, right. Thank you very much. We're coming to the end of our time. I'd really like us to do that poll one more time. Uh, so if we could get Slido back up, please. Um, at the start of the session, climate change had 42%, and uh, the second place was a tie between social cohesion and cyber at 28% each. So let's see what the poll looks like right now. Climate change has been resolved in the last 45 minutes. Oh, it's coming back up again. I think uh, Dr. Rania has really brought the economic aspect to the fore. Cyber attack remains at 27, so fairly static. And social cohesion going back up again. Okay, let's... <laughs> I think we can freeze the frame over here. I, I guess um, it looks like apart from the next pandemic, which I suppose we're feeling very confident about our ability to deal with it because 
hopefully it's a, we've had plenty of rehearsals, unfortunately, this year. But it looks like the other risks are fairly dispersed, so it could come from anywhere. And we're ending the session today with the risk of a rupture in social cohesion as the most important risk that the world is unprepared for going forward. So it's, it's not a very happy note to end on, but I must say that I'm, uh, we've had an energetic and a positive session. So I'm really grateful to our distinguished speakers, uh, Peter Giger, Chandra Prakash, uh, Minister Rania. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you to all of you in the audience uh, for, for being with us. Uh, and with that, we bring this uh, event to a conclusion. Thank you very much.